Awesome. So next up we have Team Nodex, uh, which comes from the Wichrup and Bhatia Lab. So take it away. Can someone hand me the clicker? Thank you. I just need that. Can we get the slides? Yeah. Great. Uh, while we wait for that, uh, I'm J.D. Bidani. I'm a PhD candidate in Sangeeta Bhatia's lab. And my name is Naveen Mehta, and I'm a PhD candidate in Dane Wittrup's group. And today we're going to talk to you about our ideas for monitoring the lymph node non-invasively. And doing this in a uh, robust manner so that we can actually detect uh, invasive tumors early on. And that's because 90% of cancer deaths are due to invasive tumors. That's when a primary tumor invades from that location throughout the rest of the body. And when we think about how these tumors invade, we often think about the highways of the body, the bloodstream, the blood vessels. But not a lot of sewers come to mind when we think about the body. <laughs> and just like sewers, the lymphatics are very important. And they act as um, these tissue clearing vessels of the body. And within these lymphatics are these tiny little lymph nodes. And these lymph nodes are the powerhouses of the lymphatics. They act as the, the sort of central site of the lymphatics. And a lot of important things occur in the lymph nodes, including a lot of immune activity. So what cancer does in this case is actually it hijacks the body's sewers. So what you're seeing here is a primary tumor that is hijacked through these lymphatics and into the lymph node. And we really need to find out if a patient that has a primary tumor has a lymph node metastases, because this really affects how we treat these patients. If there's a lymph node metastases, we actually need to give these patients extra therapy to treat the extra tumor uh, burden for this patient. And what you're seeing here is evidence to that point. So on the left um, is data showing um, these were patients that had a primary surgery but did not have a lymph node metastasis. And they performed really well. That bar is a uh, amount of recurrence that occurs after therapy. But on the right were patients that had a tumor that was treated. And they also had a lymph node metastasis. And you can see right away that there's a lot of local recurrence. But what we can do is treat these patients differently. If we know that there's nodal, recur nodal metastases, we can give them additional therapies, in this case, radiotherapy, that really brings this down. We can really improve patients' lives if we know if they have nodal status, what their nodal status is. So clearly, lymph nodes are important for conventional therapy, and understanding them will change patient lives. But it's also going to be really important for next generation therapies, like immunotherapy, because the lymph node is really the heart of many immunotherapies right now. And this is the site where a lot of effector self-priming happens. So if we understand what's going on in the lymph node, we can do a lot better with immunotherapy. And as you heard just now, immunotherapy has one problem. Only about 30% of patients respond. So if, before we give them the immunotherapy, we can understand what immune activity is occurring in the lymph node, then we can really push the amount of cures that immunotherapy can give us much higher. Great, so how do we get this information? Information is valuable. Right now, clinicians are faced with only two options, an invasive biopsy or non-invasive imaging, but that doesn't provide us too much information. And in the case of biopsy, there's a strange catch-22. So you often do a biopsy when you think there's no uh, tumors. But how do you know there's tumors in the no lymph nodes that you extract before you extract them? You don't. So this catch-22 is challenging because you don't want to do all these extra surgeries because of the high morbidity associated with these invasive surgeries. So this is a patient that had lymph nodes from their arm removed. And you can imagine what happens when you take these factories of the lymphatics, these sewers out. There's massive tissue swelling. This is known as lymphedema. And in some studies, up to 40% of patients that had lymph nodes removed had lymphedema. So clearly, we want to minimize the morbidity associated with these. And imaging doesn't provide us the resolution that we need. So this was a patient that had stage 1 testicular cancer. After therapy, they went on. Um, they went on surveillance. And with this, uh, they found an 8 millimeter lymph node right here, this white arrow. So this 8 millimeter lymph node, the radiologist said, I don't know. There might be metastases. I don't know. So what did they do? They waited nine months for this patient. The same patient comes back. Nine months later, the lymph node is enlarged to 10 millimeters, metastatic relapse. But that's nine months that this patient and their clinicians didn't know what was really going on. That's nine months we could have put them on therapy and improved their overall survival. So really, we need to know what the disease is doing and not just if it's there. So if we could do this, what is achievable? Right? So if we could do this, what, is, what, what can we really do? Well, 
If we could do this in non-invasive and measure tumor cell activity, we could get at whether or not there's tumor invasion into the metastases earlier, and by doing this, really impact clinic uh, patient outcomes. If we could understand the tumor immune interface before we administer these immunotherapies, we could drive home and Im improve uh, next generation immunotherapies. Do this non-invasively. We minimize the morbidity. No more lymphedemas for these patients. And if we could do this simply, say a urine test, then we can monitor for relapse effic efficaciously and also monitor for therapeutic eff efficacy. So is there a single biomarker that can do that? The answer is no. But we think that we can actually get synthetic biomarkers that can be measured. And we think measuring protease activity is one way to do it. So proteases are actually just molecular scissors. There are these enzymes in the body that cut up proteins. And just by being able to cut up all the proteins in the body, they regulate a lot of biology. And also, consequently, anything that regulates a lot of biology regulates a lot of pathologies, too. So we asked the question, are proteases involved in the aspects of tumor metastases that we care about? So we queried the Ch Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, which has patient data associated with lymph node metastases. And we checked to see whether in these lymph node metastases from these patients, uh, there were proteolytic signatures that we could find. And the answer was yes. So you're seeing here a list of different proteases we found from the Cancer Genome Atlas. And if we could measure these non-invasively in a multiplex fashion, we could really accurately stage tumor invasiveness. And on the other side, we asked the question, are proteases involved in the tumor immune axis? Are they involved in immune cell function? And you guys know the answer. It's yes. So if we can measure these proteases and understand the role that these proteases are uh, uh, taking, we could administer immunotherapy more, a lot more robustly and predict whether or not a patient will be a good candidate for these treatments. So great. We want to measure a bunch of proteases. And if we can do this non-invasively, multiplex, that would be awesome. So how do we get there? Well, in the Batia lab, uh, over the past 10 years or so, we've been developing tools that allow us to measure protease activity non-invasively. So the way this works is we have, on the surface of this iron particle, small peptide fragments. These peptide fragments get chewed up by the proteases I mentioned. And we inject them into the body. They accumulate at this site of disease. And when they get chewed up by the proteases, these fragments are small now. What they can do is leak into the blood vessels and get concentrated into the urine. And what we think this gives us is protease amplification and renal concentration for an ultra-sensitive disease monitoring. But the problem is all our particles go to the primary tumor, which is great for primary tumor monitoring. But we don't have the ability yet to get to the lymph nodes. But fortunately, I know Naveen and I know what his lab's been working on. Right. So in the Wittrip lab, we're very interested in delivering various cargos into the lymph node. And we actually derived some of our inspiration from this one clinical procedure. So clinicians have found that if you inject this blue dye in a simple subcutaneous injection, it actually lights up the nearby lymph nodes. And so this dye is essentially doing the exact same job that we want to get done. So we did a little bit of investigation into, um, into the literature and found that the main reason why this dye works is that it binds to this one protein, and that protein is serum albumin. This is the most prevalent protein in both our blood and in our interstitial space around, the, around our tissues. And it turns out that if dyes can bind to this protein, it takes them directly into the lymph nodes. So being the protein engineers that we are in the Wittrip lab, we tried to leverage our technologies to use serum albumin for our own purposes and uh, deliver different cargos into the lymph node as well. So for our work, we're largely interested in delivering peptides for the purposes of vaccination into the lymph node, but we utilize this exact same strategy here. So what you're seeing here is a simple subcutaneous injection done just beneath the skin, and if we attach small fragments, like peptides, onto the surface of albumin, it'll drain into the lymph node and we'll get the response that we want. So at this point, the Batia lab was doing their thing on the fourth floor, we were doing our thing on the second floor, but our ideas really merged over one night, and like all great things, over some beer. And this is largely possible because JDP and I aren't just collaborators in this area, but we're also roommates as well. So at home, we got to thinking about this new platform technology, which we're calling NodeX. So you can see even just from this first panel here that it's a marriage between these two labs. We're using human serum albumin as our carrier agent, uh, but we're utilizing the, the Batia lab technology at making a diverse array of protease responsive peptides. This is a multiplex system that can be responsive to all of the different proteases that are relevant in the lymph node. We will then apply bioconjugation strategies to make those peptides um, covalently linked onto serum albumin. They can then be injected subcutaneously 
into the patient, and this would be at a site-specific manner. So for example, if the patient had melanoma on his or her arm, you would inject these protein peptide conjugates at that site, allowing them to drain into the most relevant lymph nodes where both the metastases and the immune response would be. And this uh, could theoretically be, uh, be done with any sort of tumor where, lymph, where nodal involvement is involved. Um, not, just, not just melanoma, but also, for example, breast cancer or lympho lymphomas. And it's really in the lymph node uh, where the magic happens, because this is where the peptides encounter their cognate uh, proteases. And if the proteases uh, chew up those peptides, they liberate small fragments, which are then small enough to get out of the lymphatics, drain into the blood, into the kidney, get renally concentrated. And in, in the urine, you can just perform simple mass spectrometry to look back at mass signatures and see precisely, with high degrees of resolution and high accuracy, which proteases were actually in that lymph node, giving us a way to peer into the lymph node in a way that was not not previously possible. So what sort, of, uh, what sort of impact can we make on patients' lives? Well, we think it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable that the things that are possible if, if Nodex works out. Um, so we think that we can measure cancer activity and invasiveness uh, better than any, any sort of uh, method out there right now. Biopsies can only see what the, if the disease is there, not what it's doing. So this means we can detect metastases earlier. We can, we can introduce um, interventions much earlier and prevent metastasis um, in, the, in these patients. We also think uh, beyond conventional therapies, we may be able to provide a companion diagnostic so that even before immunotherapy is prescribed, because these things are expensive, they have side effects, we can actually see and clinicians can understand whether these immunotherapies are likely to work before you even, um, before you even administer them. We also do so in a way that's less invasive and more simple than anything else that's out there. So we really think that we're carving out new ground here in being able to make an even more informative uh, diagnostic than what's currently out there, but in a way that's significantly less invasive as well. And so we've talked about some lofty ideas here, but how are we actually going to get this done? Well, it's going to start out with an in silico set of tests, where we just try to see what proteases are in the lymph node and what substrates can we design to test them, followed by chemical synthesis to actually make these peptides and figure out how to get them onto serum albumin. And finally, we'll do some in vivo work uh, to make sure that they, are, they actually have the sensitivity that we need to move forward. And JDP and I were pretty, actually pretty excited about this, so we've already gone ahead and tackled some of these points. So our in silico work has convinced us that there, there is a real proteolytic signature out there. We can tap into it as long as we have the funding to make the right peptides and make the chemistry work. Um, we also know that we can get it into albumin and that it can get to lymph nodes. So some of the real exciting in vivo work is upcoming, and we'd love to have the Koch Institute on board as we move forward with this exciting project. And with that, we'd like to thank our collaborators, our funding sources, and all of you for attention. And we'll take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. I, I, when I read this plan, I was fascinated because from a clinical perspective, it seemed like the easiest for the patient and physicians, right? You inject, you, let, you do its work, you collect urine, you do the readout, et cetera. But one of the questions I began asking is, is you're, you're essentially creating two platforms. One is a nanosensor and one is a delivery technology. And was there a way in which you could, and, and whenever you add two platforms together, it, the complexity becomes much more enormous. And so was there a two, was there a step-by-step -step way to go about doing it? For example, do you have to have a urinary output? Could you actually use imaging modality once you've had the lymph node in, um, the nanosensors in there? And so had you thought about sort of a two-step approach as opposed to going for the whole enchilada at once? Right, yeah, we have. So you, may, you say you make a great point about imaging. Yeah. And we really think that because these albumin particles traffic so beautifully to lymph nodes that matter, and uh, instead of the fragment coming off the particle of the albumin being renally excreted, we can tailor that fragment to actually light up the lymph node when there's immune activity or tumor cells in that area. So it can be a non-invasive test that doesn't involve imaging, but we can also tailor this to imaging as well. So I think it uh, it's depends on what the clinician needs. And did you not thought, though, just for this experiment, it would be better just to try it for the one for the imaging? So the really powerful thing about this approach is the ability to multiplex. We can measure all these proteases at the same yeah. time with mass barcodes. With imaging, what's challenging is the number of things you can measure at the same time. Yeah. So really, in those approaches, you can only measure one or two uh, events. Um, so in this way, we can measure up to 20 proteases simultaneously. OK. And uh, Chris asked the question earlier, and or Vicky, maybe. Uh, which is just the business model. I'm a venture capitalist, and so in some sense, translation has to lead to business. And, and again, in reading the plan, the possibilities were enormous um, between monitoring diagnosis as an adjunct to therapy, et cetera. Uh, what's, what, what is your business plan? What's the business model for this? What's the best way to extract value? 
So yeah, I think um, if, we, if you actually think about the urinary diagnostics, then we're going to enter the market as a diagnostic. Uh, but one of the more interesting approaches that I think uh, could, be, could be really interesting is um, the way that we're monitoring the immune response would actually just be a companion diagnostic. So what's going on a lot in a lot of the field from, in immunotherapy right now is uh, they'll, do, they'll do clinical trials for things like checkpoint blockade and take several samples over, over the course of several different time periods to try to find biomarkers that are predictive of what works and what doesn't work. And uh, we could use our diagnostic in several different time points as well, where they just take a simple urine test at different patients at different time periods and see which of those patients and which proteolytic signatures are actually predictive of the immune response. Um, and if we, if we hit gold there, if we're able to find a less invasive biomarker than what's currently out there, um, then we think that it would, we would be able to market it as a simple companion diagnostic in advance of immunotherapy. And probably my last question was, obviously, if you get the money, you're talking about a year and doing a lot mm -hmm. in a year. Have you thought about that next step, what the next two or three years looks like, and what does that need from a funding perspective? And yeah, sure. So a lot of the initial work will be done in preclinical mouse models. But uh, recently in, in our labs, we've gotten really interested in translating to humans, obviously. Yeah. And we've gotten a lot better at actually collecting extracted surgical samples and looking at proteolytic signatures in those samples with our technology. Mm -hmm. So I think for the first year, we will we'll try these pretty clinical models. But afterwards, we're really excited to test out these patient samples from surgeries and see how our technology works in them before we start injecting humans. So that's probably the, the immediate next step after the one year. Others' questions? I, I thought it was incredibly interesting and, and would be very valuable. Um, how are you figuring out the um, protease um, marker, I guess? Yeah. Or so profi profile, profiles. is a better word. Yeah, so in terms of the, the metastasis aspect of it, uh, we have access to the Cancer Genome Atlas, which recruits patients with uh, primary tumors and metastatic tumors and they collect these uh, patient samples and sequence them, and they also measure gene expression. So we're actually querying these patient samples for patients that have a metastatic lymph node and comparing the metastatic lymph node expression levels uh, from the tumors compared to a primary tumor, for example, and healthy lymph nodes at the same time. So we have preliminary results on up to 10 proteases that seem extra extraordinarily upregulated in these lymph node metastases but there's more we can do getting these patient samples. And with the urinary output, how, how do you know which lymph nodes it's coming from? Because one of your goals was to not have to go mm -hmm. pull out lymph nodes, but if you know there's a metastasis there, you do need to get them, and which ones are you gonna go get? Right, so we get that information from our injection site. So we choose the injection site such that it only hits the, the local lymph nodes. And because uh, once they encounter their proteases, the fragments are then small enough, they get out of the lymph node immediately. You can know that those first lymph nodes that they hit are the initial site. So it's kind of like one. So it, as you're thinking about um, surgeons who are occasionally confident in their abilities, <laughs> how many of them think that they are actually missing a lot of nymph, lymph nodes on one side or the other, and how quickly do you think the adoption of this would be if you had this technology? So I, I think the surgeons aren't missing the lymph nodes that are important, but they're perhaps grabbing too many lymph nodes that aren't important. So I think that's one side of the um, morbidity that occurs. And we think that if we can get this technology, as Naveen mentioned, to be a companion diagnostic for immunotherapies, which I think would revolutionize the way we treat patients with immunotherapies would be really valuable. And I think that that would be uh, earlier adoption that we could actually go for. So I have a quick question about, um, about your, how you view the signal to noise problem here. You've got, you know, you have these highly selective proteases that are cancer specific. You're trying to come up with an early warning system for lymph node involvement. But this, the, the fragments are all pooling in the urine along with fragments from lots of other proteases, among other things. So do you have any insight into what your signal-to-noise challenge is going to be in this situation if you're going to actually in enhance the current technology? Yeah, so we've recently gotten better at improving our signal-to-noise by engineering more robust uh, peptide substrates for the specific proteases that we want. So we can actually improve the specificity for an individual protease. And um, in addition, each substrate is barcoded in a unique way, so we actually know which protease, which substrate was precisely cleaved by that mass barcode. So in the end, we actually get uh, these uh, this, this really pictogram of what's going on. 
So we think we can get some sensitivity and specificity that way. Is that or, yeah, I think just following up on this, I mean, if you work backwards from this being useful from a commercial standpoint, you could almost ask the question, how, what kind of specificity sensitivity do you need to have for people to be able to make decisions that are falling under a regulatory regime? And there's lots of other tests that are used in that regard, and then kind of back into the question that Vicky is asking, because I think then you could say, how big a trial would I need to do to convince somebody that they should use the decisions based on my data for anything other than research? Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of knowable, and it's good to ask those questions early on and say, okay, how many substrates would I need, right. et cetera. So I think that's, if you're gonna think ahead, commercialization, that might be something to pull up front. Cool, thank you. How would this work in practice? So somebody's had cancer, and now you want to make sure that you're detecting the metastases. So how many, how, what frequency do you think you'd have to, to deploy this diagnostic? And if you're saying you have to inject this near to where you know, the lymph node is that you're trying to do, does that mean you have to do multiple injections? Um, uh, you know, I'm just sort of trying to figure what's the patient experience? Yes, yeah, so in terms of how the patient would perceive this, I think, that we would, our time points in which we would need to administer this diagnostic is pretty similar to what they do right now. So the same way a patient would, an equivocal patient would come in and get um, imaging done several times. Um, during that exact same visit, we could just do the simple subcutaneous injection and they, we could take a urine sample. Um, and then in terms, of, uh, in terms of making sure we target the different lymph nodes, um, I think we could we can envision that being done on, on uh, sort of more, uh, more quick but repetitive visits to, to make sure that the urine sample that we're getting is from that specific lymph node. All right, now I'm going to wrap us Thank up. Thank you. Thank, Thank you both so much. <laughs> if anyone needs a laser pointer, it's right there. <laughs> <laughs>